Um, okay, I think we're set. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, the Columbian Editorial Board is pleased to welcome candidates for Clark County Superior Court Judge. We'd like to welcome incumber, incumbent Bernard Viljasek okay, and challenger Robert Vukanovich. And again, I apologize on the names. I'm terrible at that. Um, also, would like to welcome reporter Paris Aiken, um, who is joining us. We'll be taking notes. She will not be asking questions in this particular meeting, but she might want to speak with you afterwards. Okay. Um, let's see. We also we are recording this for use on our website, as the video camera is up in the corner, or corner and we also have tape recording going. I okay. am Greg Jane, editorial page editor here at the paper. I will be moderating the meeting. We'll uh, try to keep answers on point and try to keep them fairly short, and we'll keep it moving along. And That's going to be tough with two uh, legal beagles. It here. will, yes, but uh, we'll do our best. So um, we'll start with introductions. Um, please briefly explain why the voters of Clark County should elect you. Um, we'll start with the challenger, Robert. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I want to thank all of you for having us here today. Um, Really, there's, there's, there's four reasons that, uh, that I want to emphasize why I think the voters should vote for me. And one is, is I have a very broad uh, legal base of experience. Um, my opponent, I believe, has been practicing about 16 years. 13 of those years has all been in the, the prosecutor's office um, in the civil for the last three or four years and then the criminal before that. I've had 26 years of legal experience, and my experience has included real estate law, business law, and for the last 15 years, mostly family law and criminal law. Uh, also, I believe to be, a, to be a judge in this community, you should have roots in this, this community. Um, my opponent has, been, has lived in Clark County for a year and a half. Um, I have lived in Clark County for the last 24 years. I've raised four kids in this, in this community, uh, past president of the Clark County Bar Association, uh, Board of Trustees for the Volunteer Lawyers Program, conducting numerous clinics for those less fortunate individuals in our community. Member of the Rotary Club of Vancouver. Um, I, was, I was in charge of uh, the gala for the Festival of Trees for several years, which raises community or money for this community. Uh, president of the Cascade Little League. Uh, I coached Little League Baseball. I coached uh, CCYF football uh, for about five years. Um, now, I... My opponent might say he's well. I've worked in this community for 13 years, so I have roots. And to me, that's that's a problem simply because when you work, well, my philosophy is you should spend the money in the community in which you work. My opponent has worked in this community, but then he traveled across the bridge and he lived in Portland for basically that 13 years, um, and spent the money in Portland, Oregon, rather than here in uh, in Clark County. Um, also, I would ask the voters to look at the last bar poll, the Clark County Bar Association bar poll, which was just done this last April. Um, and it is comprised of the local attorneys here in this community. Um, and it included myself and included Mr. Valjasic. Uh, it had four individual categories. One was uh, legal ability. One was judicial temperament. One was integrity. One was legal experience. I was the top vote getter in all four of those categories. And then in the fifth category, where it asked them who was their choice for the next appointment uh, for the judge, I won that category as well. Uh, unfortunately, the governor didn't even interview me, uh, which I felt was somewhat of a slap in the face to all of the attorneys in our community, simply because the, the message I felt he was sending was, is, is I don't care what you local attorneys say, I don't care what your observations are, uh, I'll make my own decision. And then lastly was my, the endorsements. If you look at my website, I have uh, to date, I think, a little over 80-some-odd endorsements. Almost all exclusively those endorsements are from uh, members of this community. Um, it's from a wide spectrum from this community. For example, politically, I have uh, uh, Tim Levitt, mayor of uh, Vancouver. I have uh, Liz Pike, who is the state legislature for the 18th district. Um, in the medical field, I have Dr. Richard Green, Dr. Mark Johnson, Dr. Danny Warner, and Dr. Carly Whittem, all well-respected doctors within this community. Um, in the legal community, um, I have uh, 
which I feel very honored. I have over 20 some odd attorneys who have let me use their name and put them as endorsements, which is somewhat rare when you're running against a sitting judge because if I should lose, they may have to be in front of them. But uh, they were more than willing to say, please put our name down uh, because we endorse you. Um, and this included uh, Tanya Riddell, who's a former Clark County Deputy Prosecutor, uh, Joe Laughlin, who's a former City of uh, Vancouver uh, Deputy Prosecutor. Both of them are now in private practice. Mark Stoker, who does a lot of real estate law. Uh, Jeff Souter, criminal defense attorney. Uh, and Brian, Brian Herlin, who does business law, just to name a few. Like I said, there's over 20 of them on that list. I also received the endorsement from the uh, retired uh, Washington State Supreme Court Justice Jim Johnson, um, which, was, which was interesting in itself in that um, when, well, he, wanted, he made me come up to Olympia and sit down and chat with me because he said he didn't want to be, he said a lot of times what happens is, is, is that a judge will bring an endorsement to him, say, hey, sign this, this is a good friend of mine, um, or I know this person, and endorse, and they just endorse. And he said, I don't do that, I've never done that. Um, I want to know you. And as I drove up to Olympia, we sat down, we talked for some time. Um, he got to know my practice, not got to know what I do. And uh, at the end of the, our meeting, says, you have my endorsement. Um, and then I also have a number of civic and business leaders in this community, um, which includes, and this is, this is a, just a short list, uh, but, and it, there's much more than just this, but it includes people like Keith Copeland, Elson Strahan, Dick Hanna, Bruce Davidson, Arch Miller, Jeff Hamm, James Martin, Bruce Paris, and Tom Hunt, all leaders of this community. And all were more than willing to say, Bob, we want to put our name on down as endorsement. We're, we're behind you. So uh, for those reasons, that's why I'm asking the voters to, to vote for me. Thank you. And uh, Bernard? Well, I'm Judge Bernard Veljasic. I'm Superior Court Judge here in Clark County, Department 5. Uh, I've been serving this community since 2001 as a prosecutor first and now as a judge. I uh, tried cases in uh, state uh, Clark County District Court, Juvenile Court, Superior Court, uh, Federal District Court, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. I've had cases there as well as Division Two of the Court of Appeals. And so it's with that experience that I was brought over. Uh, um, I went, I worked for the Civil Division. I managed uh, high complexity caseloads where, for example, it's not just one attorney on a case, but four attorneys. I was lead attorney on a, on a big case recently in federal court. And so but I come to the bench uh, already having served for uh, several months. It's not my first rodeo. I come to the bench having served on two administrative boards where I developed my skills as uh, a judicial decision maker. I served on the state um, clemency and pardons board. And the state clemency and pardons board hears petitions on the most serious offenses in the state. And it's individuals seeking to be either released from prison early, uh, having their cases completely expunged off their record. So we're talking about high level, highly complex issues um, and highly emotional issues as well. But I also served on the Clemency and Pardons Board for the State Bar Association, which, I mean, these are open opportunities for, for folks to, to give of their time as, as lawyers. So that was another one that I decided to to invest my time in. And that's an, a board that screens individuals who want to be lawyers. And they might have questionable histories, maybe some criminal activity, drug activity, things like that, that gave the Bar Association reason to hold a hearing. Well, we'd hold hearings. I took evidence. I issued written opinions, uh, recommendations to the state Supreme Court. Again, high level. Uh, serious matters. And so I think being a judge requires the ability to engage in that complexity. It's a high pressure position, I can tell you, being in it. It is a, it is a high pressure position and having experience making decisions on serious matters has been of great benefit to me. 
But a judge also needs the appropriate temperament. I've got charge of a courtroom where I have high, highly emotionally charged litigants coming through the door every day. And my temperament is such that, and I'm required to bring calm and order to that courtroom. And that's not always easy. But a judge has to also have the appropriate character to, to lead that courtroom, to lead the proceedings. That requires a judge keep his or her word. It requires a judge um, be consistent. And it requires me to uh, have the intestinal fortitude required to make the decision even when it's hard. I've got to follow the law based on the facts that I hear after carefully listening to all the parties in front of me. And I strive to do that. So it's the, for that reason that I, I also have broad support throughout the community. A majority of the state Supreme Court endorses me. Numerous judges in this community, those who have done the job, who know what it takes. Uh, Sheriff Lucas, uh, on the other hand, Bob Schaefer, on the other side of the political spectrum. And so, I, you know, I won't, I won't go through the list, but um, I've received that broad support because of my interaction in this community as a prosecutor. Handling cases, the arson case in Battleground, the violent uh, ID theft drug dealer out in Washougal, the individual in uh, Vancouver who threatened his girlfriend with a gun. I mean, these are cases that I've handled over the years, which required me to be out in the community interacting with witnesses and victims and doing justice, which is the role of the prosecutor. That was also great training for a judge, by the way. So it's with that that I hope uh, the voters will retain me as their judge in November. With that, given those tough cases, how much leeway do judges have when it comes to sentencing? In sentencing, so 1981, the Washington legislature changed the way the sentencing is done in Washington. And every case has what's called a standard sentencing range. And to go beyond that standard sentencing range, you need particular findings, uh, factual findings. So you have to have a hearing and have these findings put in, or there could be a stipulation to those findings, of course. But the short answer is not much. You get a uh, you know, 15 to 19 months or something along those lines. And so the whole question is high end or low end. There's not much, you know, the presumptive sentence is the mid range. So there's not a lot of discretion in sentencing. By the time these cases get to me for sentencing, uh, they're already fairly worked up. In your so time on the bench, have you typically leaned toward the high end of the range or the low end? Well, I can't answer that because then I'd have, if I said a high end, then I'd have every defense attorney in the community affidaviting me and not, not coming before me. Part of my ethical obligation is to be available for the cases. So if I'm ruling myself out. I, in the sentencing that I've done, um, I treat every case individually. We're talking about a person on the other side of the bench from me. I sit... They, they lift us up high, so we look down on individuals. I think they do that for a reason, to highlight the authority. But one thing that I learned early as a prosecutor is, as a prosecutor, I had to be careful about what cases I charged. And it's the same thing as a judge. You're, the whole weight of the state of Washington is coming down a bear on that person, on that individual. And so you have to listen to the facts apply the law, make the best decision you can. Well, let's talk, about, if I could, a little bit about the appointment, and we can get back to my response. Okay. Um, and in, in a way, you've already sort of answered this question. You can expand on it as well. But um, I, I wanted to uh, talk to Bernard about this appointment. It does, generally speaking, to the layman, strike people as odd that uh, with uh, your time mm -hmm. in the legal profession versus Robert's time in the legal profession, looking at the uh, Bar Association's poll, mm -hmm. uh, that you ended up with this 
uh, with this appointment, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, the buzz at the courtroom was that it was an inside job. Mm -hmm. You knew somebody who knew somebody, and mm -hmm. you ended up with the appointment. How do you how do you respond to that, and how do you figure that this guy over here doesn't even get an interview, uh, uh, even though the majority of lawyers said what they said in the article? Okay, so let me break that into parts here, okay. So, as to, there was an interview. Uh, Bob and I both interviewed last year, uh, didn't get the appointment, and we also both interviewed this year. Uh, Bob didn't make it to the second round of interviews, which is the interview with the governor, okay. so to be clear about that. Okay. And I don't mean that as a slight or anything. That's the okay. that's the fact. That's how the proceeding went on. Um, but I think experience it has more to do than just time. I, mean, I could sit in the library for ten years and not pick up a book and get nothing done. That doesn't make me a Rhodes scholar. You got to read the stuff. You've got to do the work. In my career, I've uh, I've been very busy. I talk about these boards I did. I did that on top of my job as a prosecutor. On top of handling uh, high, high pressure, high value, heavy lifting litigation, okay? But I also founded a legal clinic right out of law school. I, it's, uh, still, it's called Open Door Legal Clinic now. It still exists. Um, I did that uh, at fairly early point in my life because of my concern about justice and access to justice for the poor. We've got an issue with that even in our county. So I think that demonstrates my concern for justice, first of all. But also uh, the heavy lifting, I've talked a lot about it already, the heavy lifting on these cases. Federal cases, they, they don't call them, they don't use that as a, as a a punchline for a joke for nothing. Well, I don't want to go into too much more detail okay. on that, but I but I can talk I'm, about the bar poll. Yeah. Uh, we'll okay. Talk a little bit about the, the bar sure. poll. Sure. Well, the bar poll. There's about 500 members of the uh, Clark County Bar Association, and 188 members voted. Uh, there were five of us who applied for this position. Five of us were interviewed by the governor's council. Five of us submitted to the bar poll. And Bob received 37%. Uh, I received 27, then there were 17, and then some other percentages. But the difference there is about 20 votes between Bob and I. So there's a plurality, there's no clear majority. It's certainly a data point that uh, people might want to consider, but I think if you looked at, at the objective criteria, what I've done at my judicial, quasi judicial experience, my heavy lifting litigation in both the, the criminal, civil, appellate level, those things, uh, my founding of the legal clinic, those okay, things. Okay, and the last point of my question, you, you happen to know somebody up in the governor's office that uh, maybe uh, uh, well, Robert doesn't know? I know Robert knows him because he's the guy who interviews us, uh, the governor's counsel, and I happened to receive a fellowship in 2009. One of the... Uh, few times I was blessed enough in my career to be uh, recognized for the work I've done. Not, a, not every lawyer gets that. Um, and I was one of, uh, he and I were two of the 15 people who received that fellowship. Uh, so... Let, uh, let, let me go to Robert. Yeah. Any, did you want to add anything to uh, just, this just, just a few minor points is, is, is and he talked about the, the, kind of the fifth category, the overall choices of everything. Um, I think more importantly are the four individual categories of the legal ability, legal experience, legal, judicial temperament, and integrity. Um, in all of those, I received the, the overwhelming voice of the most qualified in all four of those categories, not just the, the overall choice, which I did as well. Um, and so I felt that was important. Also, the uh, uh, you say ask him about it. Mr. Brown did interview me, but as I said before, I was talking about an interview with the governor, that final step. Um, Mr. Brown and Mr. Veljasic know each other, and how, how much that played in, I don't know. Well, how much do you think it played in? I, <laughs> I'm not sure I even want to, want to speculate at this point. You don't want to, okay. Well, anyway. I, it was your shot. I it failed was, to it was mention. your opportunity. Uh, the, 
the bar poll, what I wanted to say at one point was it had a lot to do with re name recognition. And it's an important data point. I don't want to uh, demean that at all. But, you know, I practiced in relative anonymity at the prosecutor's office. My clients were those shut-ins at the county government buildings. And so I think that has a lot to do with uh, the results in the bar poll. So, thank yeah. you. Can I just add one thing is, is because he's talking about all of his work, just so that it's clear here, I've handled over a thousand criminal cases, over a thousand criminal cases, and those range always from A's, B's, and C felonies. Um, I've handled over probably almost a thousand family law matters as well. Um, so uh, as far as experience, I think my experience is as, as is great or possibly even greater than Mr. Baljasic as far as the number of cases that we've, that we've done. Okay. Go ahead. I was going to say, uh, and uh, Robert, if you could uh, answer this, one of the things that uh, Bernard, uh, Judge Bernard, Valjasek, is that what you pronounce that? It's Valjasek, but close enough. I've been called worse. Thank you. <laughs> if you speak in my direction or gesture in my direction, I'll answer. All right. Anyway, you had said that it was important uh, to have a good temperament, a good character, uh, intestinal fortitude. Now, he didn't say this, but maybe it's implied that you don't have those things. Yeah, don't, don't, don't say I've said that. No, oh, he didn't okay. say that. Okay, all right. I just wanted, wanted do you have clear. any of those things? Well, I think the bar poll indicates that I do. I mean, one of the items was judicial temperament. And again, I was extremely well qualified for judicial temperament. Um, I think I am, I, I think I have the temperament that's needed for this position. I think I'm, I'm reasonable. I'm I conduct myself in a professional and I believe a very um, civil manner with my other attorneys who that sometimes doesn't always occur with each other. Um, but I think that's important because I, you know, there's some attorneys who believe that you have to have a steamroller effect in order to be successful and I've never had that approach. It was I've always felt that you can deal with your the other side in a very civil manner um, and professional manner and still be zealously arguing for your client and be successful. And that's the way I've tried to lead my entire career. Um, along those lines, you mentioned that uh, you met with Jim Johnson and yes. got his support. What was he impressed with? Uh, he was impressed with the, um, the experience that I've had. Um, the fact that uh, he knows, for example, that down here you're probably looking at 90% of the cases are family law cases, criminal cases. Um, and then I've been doing that for the last 15 years. Um, you'll find me in both criminal arena and also the family law arena practically every week of the year. Um, and so he, he liked that. Uh, he liked the fact that uh, um, basically we talked about temperament and how I dealt with certain clients and how I dealt with certain uh, of, of other attorneys in town. Um, we discussed some of my cases. He, uh, as a matter of fact, one of the cases that uh, he had just ruled on shortly before he left the bench was a case I did not argue in front of him, but I did the trial here in Clark County in front of uh, Judge uh, Collier. Um, and so he was familiar with that case, and we chatted about that case. And so uh, that really was what it was. Uh, Bernard, what have you learned since being appointed to the bench? How is it different than what you expected? Well, I think... <laughs> there's some heartbreaking aspects to it. There's a high number of individuals coming before the court that lack uh, representation of counsel. That slows down the court processes. It's their in, uh, resource intensive cases. So that's, that's the first thing that struck me. Is, you know, these are folks that they want their disputes resolved. They're coming, they're coming looking for justice. Some of them don't have even a basic GED. How are they going to understand the forms, the statutes? So, so that's the first thing. The other thing is, boy, people are ticked off when they come to court. And they're ticked off at everybody, even the judge. And it's, it's so important to maintain control, maintain composure, if you lose it, I mean, we've, we've seen it on, on YouTube, right? We've seen the judges losing. There's a video out of a judge telling a, an attorney to go out in the hallway while he, he's going to kick his you-know-what. And, you know, it's, 
it's a difficult job in that regard. So that has been maintaining composure, maintaining the presence and dignity of the office. I think a judge has to be patient, dignified, and courteous at all times. We don't have the opportunity of having a bad day. This is that person's one case, one big case in their life. Most people don't go to court very often. If they do, it's prob probably, you know, there's repeat offenders or something like that. But holding your peace in that regard, that's been interesting. I didn't think it would, it would be that emotionally charged, but I got to say, I love it. I, I've asked for the hard cases in my life. I've asked for the tough assignments. I tackled the homeless legal clinic, the issue with uh, lack of legal service for the home for the homeless. So, so I enjoy that stuff. I, I don't mean to to go back, but one thing I'm, I didn't get a chance to respond to was, and I, I wanted to, and that was, you would ask Mr. Valjasek about, oh, does he sense on the high end right. or middle and so forth. And what I wanted to make clear was, is he has not sat in the adult criminal courtroom as a judge yet. His assignment is family law. Mm -hmm which he has not done for the last 13 years and is a brand new area of law for him that he is, I think, still learning. Um, but when he says, well, I don't want to say I've done high end, he hasn't done high end because he hasn't had the opportunity to do a high end at this point in time. Yeah. And at least not in the adult courtroom. Go ahead. Okay, and that last comment is actually what, what uh, makes that statement true. It, I've sentenced juveniles on multiple occasions. They have similar uh, sentencing ranges. So yeah, how does right. that work? Uh, so mm -hmm. you've been in family law. Mm -hmm. How is that decided? Will will this position remain in family law? How did they rotate? Uh, judge Johnson, we have a presiding judge system in our county where Judge Johnson is our presiding, and, and she makes these decisions uh, upon agreement of the rest of the elected judges. We vest her with that authority. And so... Um, I had last done family law in uh, 2000, <coughs> so it has been a while since I've done family law. I've been in family law immersion for the last five months, which is, you know, the immersion programs that drop you off in Italy and you learn how to speak Italian. So I've been doing that. Um, but my, the decision to rotate there, you know, Superior Court's a court of general jurisdiction. It's a trial court, and... Part of the selection process is finding individuals who could pick up new areas of law, right? And that's where intellectual curiosity is important, the ability to, to absorb large volumes of material quickly. Uh, I showed that in my career as representing the county. The county does stuff you don't even imagine. You know, I've done things from writing the septic code to defending civil rights cases in federal court to uh, you name it. And so that demonstrates that ability to pick up areas. So, so this Judge Johnson won't necessarily always be family law. No, no, and, and forgive you'll, me, by, I'm no, that's okay. Being a layman that's this, okay. So. You, they'll rotate out uh, okay. at some point, but I could always choose to stay. I've enjoyed it. It's it's having discretion is it, it's a fascinating process of the dance that the parties do and coming to a resolution on a case. It's fascinating. I'll tell you, um, having that investment as a judicial officer versus, you know, that fairly dry standard sentencing range, you're, you're not doing much as a judge. There's, there's, the discretion was taken away on purpose so that we could have uniformity in our sentences. But having that discretion where you're talking about kids and families and broken marriages, I... I enjoy it, so who knows? So, Robert, what are your thoughts on the sentencing guidelines? Are they Would you fall on one side of the spectrum? Are the guidelines that we have, are they reasonable? Should they be changed? I think the guidelines are reasonable, but, but I want to be very very candid with you. We have discretion to go between those. I mean, the judges have discretion to go between the low end and the high end. But in most cases, those deals of, most of the times the judges will follow the deal that the prosecutor and the criminal defense attorney have worked out. Um, I mean, if you looked at the number of times, it's probably 90 some odd percent of the time, if not more, that the judges will follow that rather than saying, well, going outside of what their deal was. And so, and, and that's because the prosecutor and the defense attorney, they've 
worked long and hard to get to where it's at. And yeah. so you'll find that most judges will follow those guidelines. Mm -hmm. I, okay. Most people will uh, concede that trying to figure out which one of you guys should end up in this seat is strange because we don't know whether you like Obama, Bush, Dole. We don't know what you think of these common bridge. Uh, you probably wouldn't answer those questions if I asked. I don't think we can. We can. That's <laughs> not See, so, so we're, we're doing what we're doing here, dancing mostly, because you guys really can't talk. Uh, but with that in mind, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get to something here, so I'll try. Uh, so Bernard gets appointed by the governor. The governor is a liberal. Uh, this is a political appointment. Can I read the tea leaves to say, and you both have an opportunity to answer this, that uh, Bernard is more liberal and you're more conservative? I would say yes to that. And how, how would you answer that, that question? How would I answer that question? Yeah. Oh, goodness. <laughs> I was thinking about the... I was I thinking was about the. <laughs> I was thinking about the huge problem in answering that question. Canons of judicial ethics govern both judicial officers and those who are candidates for judicial office. And the, the canons of judicial ethics require that we remain impartial, we maintain our integrity and our independence. And what is harmful to the public's trust in the judiciary is to pick a side like that. We really can't do that. We're, um, we're selected because of our ability to remain impartial. And so you have to look at things like concern for your community, um, your ability to maintain control in the courtroom. You have to look at those objective criteria because no matter who you are, are, if you're if you're poor, rich, left wing or right wing, you come into my courtroom, you get a fair hearing, and it's not just that you get the fair hearing, but that you perceive you get the fair hearing. That is so critical. The perception. So if I say I'm liberal or I'm conservative, then let's say I say I'm liberal. You got a conservative individual coming in front of me, arguing about uh, public public disclosure request or something like that. You guys know about those. Um, I rule against that individual. They're going to perceive that it's because of my political but, standing. But you would concede that this is a reality that you're not willing to at least speak about because, I mean, and most people out in the public can appreciate this from the U.S. Supreme Court level. Everybody knows sure. that when the president Very different, appoints, though. Uh -huh. Well, it, it, it's different, but it's the same in that there have been campaigns waged on the presidential level saying if you elect this guy, here's who you're going to get in the sure, Supreme Court sure, sure. and guess what it's going to look like when you get it. So nobody is pretending that what I said isn't real. It's right. real. Whether or not you can speak to it or not may be another issue, but it's, it's, well, you, would, you would agree it's real. Well, what I would I I'm not sure I would agree that it's real for a trial-level judge. We don't have the... Um, luxury of doing what we like. We've got to follow the law as it's written, whether that well, statute Supreme was Court written by a... Have to follow the law. No, they don't. Oh, they Supreme don't. Court justices get to create law. Well, yeah, Supreme Court justices... They, they follow past decisions uh, almost yeah, exclusively. Yeah, well, they overrule themselves, too. Okay. So they, they've got that luxury where they get to pontificate from on high <laughs> out in Washington, D.C. I've got to follow the law here. I've got to follow the law, and I don't think there's anything partisan about a broken marriage or a, a mother who's strung out on meth and her kids aren't being taken care of. There's nothing partisan about that. That's life. That's human issues. And that's what we're called to do on this level. And so everybody, yes, has their preconceived notions, <coughs> their principles that they live by. Absolutely. So I will, I will concede that. But do you have the ability to put those sure. down and follow the law? That's the question. And that, that's an act of will. 
And I'll say something else. There's a vetting process that's engaged in by Washington women lawyers. They rated me well qualified. Uh, the governor's office, they went through a vetting process twice. You know, we've been through it a couple times. They talk to everybody, opposing counsel as, as um, counsel has mentioned here. But, you know, it's hard, you're right, it's hard for voters to decide in this context of election year politics about a judge, about it's, it's a profession where you've got to be learned and you've got to make correct decisions and use your judgment. And these are tough things. So one, one other quick question, then you can answer this. So what's the last book you've read? I'm currently reading uh, The Westing Game. It's actually my <laughs> daughter. She's nine. She recommended it. It's uh, kind of a kid's book. It's only about a, about 200 pages, but it's hilarious. I forget the author. Yeah, how, what, what's the last adult book you've read? The last adult book I've read. Boy, I, start, well, uh, I started reading... Uh, the new Jim Crow. I got appointed and didn't finish it. Okay. It's Michelle Alexander. Tough the last tough book issue. I read. The last adult book. The last adult book I read was uh, was a novel. Well, it was uh, the new. Uh, I'm trying to remember the author. It was uh, the Born series. You know, they, they came out uh, the new Born, Born book, and I, and I I read the new uh, the new Born book was the last book I read. Okay. I, I read that because I was on vacation. Of, I wanted to be able to just relax. <laughs> I haven't read a lot of books lately. I've been reading cases. Okay. And, and you know? Did you have something you were going to say here before I interrupted? Well, I, the only comment I was going to make is it seems to me that kind of your question was is do you, do you lean towards judicial activism or do you not? Because I think that's part – I mean, there are those judges around this entire country who will – Make decisions based on their opinions or their 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 beliefs, um, and I, I want to say just on the record, I don't believe in judicial activism. I believe that a judge should be following the law, yep. regardless of what their personal opinion may be. They have to follow the law. Um, that's that's required. That's why I talk about the intestinal fortitude. You know, I agree. I agree with my my uh, opponent here. You know. Following the law when you don't necessarily like the outcome, that's tough. That's tough, but you got to do it. Bernard, you mentioned that you had a few of other Superior Court judges' endorsements. Mm -hmm. Superior, I mentioned the State Supreme Court. Okay. The five, and there I have Judge Gonzalez endorses me as well. Uh, Judge Bennett, who's retired. Judge Woolard, who's retired. Um, we... So I'm, assuming, you I'm assuming that the, the current, any of the current judges don't endorse. So judges this, in this race, judges are not allowed. I can't endorse a political candidate. Uh, I, I can't put my signs, uh, you know, right next to theirs. And even though that's difficult in a sign garden, <laughs> uh, but we have to be impartial in that way. But the judges who have decided to endorse. Uh, there's numerous uh, judges in town who have endorsed me. I can judge Kelly Osler, um, Sonia Langsdorf. Uh, I, I can get out the document if you like. I, I, he mentioned that. I just wondered if you've had mm -hmm. any that are endorsing you. Of the current Superior Court judges? Well, any, any of the Clark County judges. No, because I haven't. Um, my position... When I talked to a few of the judges, I felt, and I've and I've known from the in the past, is Superior Court judges they're not going to want to endorse simply because they don't know who's going to win. <laughs> then they have to meet every Tuesday and have their their judges meeting, and that would be a very awkward situation. Mm -hmm. So they they don't. So no. So you know, so in trying to to help voters decide um, or distinguish between the two of you. What have we not asked that people need to know about you and how you would handle the position, Robert? Well, I think the 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 biggest criteria of any judge is to be fair, whether it be family law, criminal law, any of the laws, um, and and I believe that that is an attribute that I that I have to be fair. I mean, if you talk to my colleagues, they would say that I, I am fair. Um, 
you know, the reason I decided to run for this position wasn't to make more money. That's not it at all because that's not, necess- that's not the case. The reason I decided to run for this, this position was because I've been in this community a long time. I wanted to give back to this community, and I wanted to make a positive difference to this community. Um, and that, include, that, that means protecting the children of our community. That means protecting individuals' rights, and not just individuals' rights, but also companies' rights, such as the Colombians and anybody else's, to make sure their constitutional rights at our level is adequately protected. And I feel that my experience uh, gives me that ability to do that, and that's why I'm seeking this position. Bernard? I think uh, you didn't ask us about the future of the court and what we bring to the bench. What is the future of the court? So, thank you. Uh, <laughs> So I bring to the bench energy and longevity. We've got a transition currently, and most good companies out there are are doing their legacy planning. We've got a generational shift underfoot uh, where we're going to see, I mean, there's another judicial opening coming up for Judge Nichols, uh, my colleague who's retiring. Uh, And there will be more. But having that long-term outlook, I think... uh, my idea is to have a strategic plan. We have new judges coming in, and with the outflow, there's an institutional knowledge base that's going to be gone. We need to preserve that institutional knowledge for the future. But we also need to look at, take a look at our demographics in this county. We're, having, we're seeing an aging population with an increase in... Uh, cases from Adult Protective Services, elder abuse cases, estate planning cases, um, guardianships. With that shift in the age demographic, I think we need to be able to respond as a court in preparing our judges to hear those cases and shifting dockets around. But there's also a demographic influx of non-English speaking populations in our county, Hispanic population and the Russian Slavic population is actually uh, growing in our county and that is I think critical that we respond as a court. The reason that makes a spike in interpreter services occur. Uh, I had a, I've had a trial recently two non-represented Spanish-speaking individuals. We needed four interpreters for the witnesses, <laughs> for the one of the individuals, the, the petitioner, the respondent, and then the respondent's witnesses. So you've got all this going on at once, four interpreters. We need to meet, be able to, to look down the road and see those changes happening and prepare for them at the front end when we put in our budget requests, when we assign our judges, those things are critical. Yes. Any other questions? If I just, yeah. d- just want to respond, because I don't know if uh, if Mr. Valjasek was referring to me being old or not. <laughs> not long no. I plan to be around a long oh, time. Right. So oh, okay. I plan to be around a long time, so this is not a short-term, uh, short-term position. I wasn't, uh, I I wasn't no, clear on about that. that. Sorry. You're not. You're all right. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Thank Thanks. you very thank much. You. Good job, Bob. Yeah.